On Independence Day 2020, America is watching as protesters and rioters and media reporters and fellow travelers fill the streets with signs and bullhorns and weapons. Their political rallies are now degenerating into mob violence with violent and hateful speech and then violent assaults against people and property. They say they are demanding justice and demanding freedom, but their process destroys public property and destroys private property and it threatens homeowners with unjust violence and it organizes arson. And then organizers insist that their actions be celebrated as heroic and righteous and historically equivalent to the American founders who launched the American Revolution. That's what they say. Now, is that how the, the founding fathers went about asserting freedom and independence? No, they never behaved as an unruly mob, but they composed themselves, they studied history, they studied their Bibles carefully, they studied the nature of tyranny and previous books like up on liberty like Lex Rex and Vindicii Contra Tyrannos, and you can look those up on a browser. And then they appealed to the authority over them, to King George III, to simply keep his word to them and to stop treating his subjects like slaves. And he refused their appeals, appeal after appeal over year after year. And so the Americans had no choice but to sit, sit down. They composed themselves and they composed then a simple document declaring their independence from their mother country. They quietly signed it and then they sat in sober reflection of the fact that they would likely be executed as traitors. They knew this very well. If Britain refused to recognize their, their new free and independent nation, each of the signers could be arrested and then hanged for treason. And they were thinking about this and it was really quiet in the room. And then Sam Adams stood to sum up in one concise sentence what they had done. And I'll tell you a little later what it was that he said. It really does summarize this entire point of history that we need to be looking at. We need to be grasping. The year was 1776. And to better understand what's going on right now in the United States in 2020, we need some background knowledge on those times and the way men were thinking in the new world and in the old world, especially in France. The American war was, the war for independence was not a revolution. We've got to get this straight. But there are some commentators telling us today that it was a rev revol revolution and that there, and there were some Frenchmen at the time who actually did think it was a revolution. Looking at it with, with unclear news coming back across the Atlantic to them, they weren't quite sure what it was. Some of them actually sailed to America to join up with the American freedom fighters and fight against King George. One young nobleman, the Comte de Saint-Simon, enlisted in 1778. He was really quickly disappointed that the American war against King George was so singularly Christian and biblically orthodox. He'd really never seen a culture quite like what he found in the colonies. The war was not wild or unruly or hateful. It wasn't a revolution. The Americans prayed for their attackers. They prayed for victory. They prayed for peace and they prayed for the freedom to be able to live under God's authority. And then they, after they had done all that, they fired with deadly aim on the British military and defeated the mightiest war power on earth at the time. Well, saint Simon was taken aback by this depth of Christian commitment and widespread sentiment in the colonies. The Americans were not afraid of the British state power, nor did they fear death. And so saint Simon had assumed that every modern fight for freedom would pursue liberté in the modern French sense, a frantic struggle for license, for freedom from God and his law, freedom from authority, freedom to be selfish and materialistic, freedom to be licentious, and the freedom for the government to run everything more according to a religion of human passions, according to the popular rebels of his time, like these two really popular authors, Julien Offray and Jean-Jacques Rousseau who were redefining man and God and government and society in, in a totally new non-Christian way.
The new French vision for national life was to erase God from history and elevate the state to a position of sovereignty, using its power to make sure that maturity in individual men was retarded and carefully engineered so that the populace never gains independent means of thought. That, that was their idea of freedom. That was their idea of, of a new scientific secular way of doing nationhood and doing society. They wanted uh, to rid the society of noble ambition and maturity and concepts of honor and wisdom to get just sweep those away. So Saint Simon was one of those new thinkers and he, he fully expected, he wasn't influenced into the American way of thinking when he was in America fighting with the young Americans in the field against the British. He was so, he was so drowning in the, this new enlightenment thinking that was popular on the continent. So he went back and he fully expected to be one of those involved in the social engineering of the new world, which he was. He survived the fighting in America. He returned to France to begin work on a social order constructed by social engineering. His public writings, along with those of Auguste Comte and the leaders of the French Revolution like Francois Noel and Babouf, inspired Karl Marx directly to create the blueprints for worldwide communist revolution and socialistic governments, which would be deliberately marked by all the features of the French Revolution, which were chaos and terror, death, disorder, government ordered mass genocide, and most importantly of all, in, in their whole overview of everything, this was the French and this was also the communists who came after them, the elimination of Christianity from every national culture. And this the French pursued openly. They had a ministry of anti-Christianity, which was one of the ones that they funded the most, which pulled down churches, it executed clergy, it repurposed surviving church buildings into these temples of reason. Now, the centerpiece of Marx's famous Communist Manif Manifesto of 1848, just a few years after all this was happening, was a restructuring of French history into exactly what he thought would be the perfect future for the rest of the world. He states that in his, in his manifesto, that chaotic conflict between special interests like rich versus poor, race versus race, capitalist versus worker, parents versus children, is the determiner of all history. That was the French way of looking at history by that time. And that's what Marx really wanted to incorporate into his, his view of the future. So to, he to steer history and control history and predestinate history and en engineer society in his own direction, Marx insisted on escalating chaos and conflict in every place that he could and taking advantage of the cultural disintegration that would follow, which brings us now to America in 2020. There are marchers in the streets and on social media claiming that their chaotic drive to violence is in the tradition of the American founders. Now, of course, it's true that our founders practiced the focused application of violence against the British military aggressors in the pursuit of quick conclusion to the war and the establishment of peace and order. They, you know, they weren't going to mess around with war. War is ugly. They didn't, want any, they didn't want any part of it for years and years and years and years. It was a last resort that they had to go to. Now, so the violence that we see in America now, is it like what our founders were doing? Is that what groups like Antifa are agitating for? So what is the character of their revolt? We need to look at this and say and remind ourselves, it, it is not hateful to analyze what's going on, nor is it some facet of white supremacy to study the past to understand the present. And so what is the behavior of these social justice warriors who call themselves revolutionaries today? Is it truly in the tradition of John Adams and George Washington, James Madison, Patrick Henry, and how they acted? Or are today's revolutionaries following the writings and the actions of Robespierre and his great admirer, Karl Marx? Why did the revolutionaries just last week <clears throat> in the Chaz community in Seattle expel police and then murder young black males? This week, why did they reference the French Revolution by placing a guillotine in front of the home of Jeff Bezos? Uh, 
Why do they quote Marx on their websites? Is that how our founders would have asserted their rights and independence? It is times like these which demand that we get our history right. And we're going to have to go back to original source documents to do this and, and look, look at where we stand today. Who are we in America? Who are the French today? How much has their history influenced them? How much has our history influenced us? In 10 days, the French celebrate their July Freedom Holiday that has fireworks and it has parades and it's called Bastille Day. And they do equate it to America's 4th of July. And that's one reason why people still call the American um, War of Independence the American Revolution. Now, what happened on Bastille Day? It's to commemorate a, a bunch of these French revolutionaries storming a, a castle prison to liberate political prisoners. But what are the real facts of history? We, we can't just take these things f for what the media tells us. Um, there actually were no political prisoners in the Bastille on that day. There were no guards to speak of. But there were 30,000 rifles which were stolen and then used in the revolution to murder middle-class bourgeois citizens who were not joining the mobs in the streets. And this is how the French Revolution became a reign of terror, the first modern experiment in genocidal revolt. So is the rage and tumult we see in 2020 America in any way connected to that revolution? That's, that's the question we need to be asking. Listening to historian Robin Phillips uh, relate the events of October the 5th, 1789. He said, a crowd of agitated women picked up knives and set off to find and kill the queen. The queen was Marie Antoinette because of some contrived rumor which was being spread about her. And by the way, the most popular form of literature at that time after the pornography, which had been mandated by the government, were, were, were little pamphlets called um, libels uh, in the French, which means libelous pamphlets. And the, it was like gossip, but it was libel being printed. It was slanderous reports and stories being printed about the rulers to turn the hearts and minds of the people against them, cause distrust of them. And so he's referring to one, some contrived rumor which was being spread about her. It stirred up these women. And then there were more of them and more of them and more of them. They picked up their knives and they set off to find and kill the queen. Reduced to the status of animals, he says, the women were singing songs about raping the queen while others demanded to have her entrails. The women marched angrily for 20 kilometers to the palace. That's how far it was from central Paris to the palace at Versailles. Arriving en masse, some 7,000 of them had gathered by that time along the way. They overpowered and beheaded two of the royal bodyguards, displaying their severed heads on pikes. When they raided the queen's bedchamber, they were furious she had fled and plunged their knives deep into her bed, leaving her mattress in a thousand pieces. The revolution then became even more animalistic, and that, that's the term that this historian is using here about the nature of, of the revolution. Even though the king was in favor of working with the greedy nobles and impatient citizens and the revolutionaries on improving the rule of law, writing a French constitution. Now, people didn't understand back then. In Western civilization, this is how we order our nations. We have constitutional law. Nobody's above it. The king's not above the constitution and nobody else is. The constitution binds everything to a covenantal law system. And so there were complaints that things were wrong in France. And yes, there were some things, there were a lot of things wrong in France, but the king was willing to work, amend the constitution, even have a new French constitution. But that, that's not what they wanted. The revolutionaries didn't want the rule of law. And that's what they were trying to get rid of. The revolutionaries favored death, chaos, and a 12-man secular lawless dictatorship. This committee of safety, and that's what they called it, created safe spaces in which revolutionaries could kill people in the name of liberté, égalité, and fraternité. That was, that was the slogan of the revolution. Um, liberty, inequality, and brotherhood. But again, these, you know, in the same way that the Soviets called 
called their their whole empire the, the the union of Soviet socialist republics. They weren't republics. Okay, they did this with abandon in a public squares, um, killing people in the name of liberty and equality and brotherhood. They were killing people in the name of their slogan. Anyone suspected of having a small business, get this, was arrested by the people, dragged to the committee, and then beheaded by the guillotine. Anyone who had the misfortune of being born into a privileged family was in great danger of being dragged to the committee of safety by the people to be judged by them simply uh, for being born into privileged families. Okay, Over 40,000 French citizens were led to the guillotine and died there. More than 350,000 Parisians, these are just citizens in one city, spent time in jail for being suspected of being politically incorrect, enemies of the revolution. An estimated 300,000 were murdered by firing squad. Okay. Do you, do, you, do you get a picture for what this was? It was truly animalistic. The American War for Independence was not like this, not in any way like this. It was a legal conflict. It was a war between two sovereign nations because we declared our independence. It, it was a fight for freedom to establish a lawful government in place of a lawless government, the lawless government that Parliament and King George III had forced on us. And so the difference now, the French Revolution was a violent political insurrection to illegally overthrow a legitimate government and to force a lawless, unconstitutional government in its place. So do you see the difference? And then the French effort was to force a cold and inhuman culture on the entire nation. That was, that was the goal, and it was animalistic, and it, and it, was, um, it was a death culture. Here's another story uh, about the queen, Marie Antoinette. She, three years later, after she had fled from the palace on that one day in 1789, she was finally, well, she had been arrested. She had been in custody. There were many trials about her and there were many more libelous reports that were published about her. She was finally manhandled to the guillotine. And on the way, she, as they were forcing her, you know, to get over here and lie down on the guillotine so we can cut your head off, she accidentally stepped on the toe of her rude executioner. And instinctively, she said, forgive me, sir. Instinctively. Why was that? It was because the direction of the Western civilization, which had been formed from all these, in Western Europe, all these pagan tribes that had been there. I mean, over a 1,500-year period now, there was this effort to try to come to some kind of civility. And, you know, Western civilization had never, ever, and it's, still never has reached its pinnacle or reached a point of maturity. It's still in its infancy. It was really in its infancy even then, back, back then in the 1700s. But she was acting instinctively just to the code of civility that she had been brought up to have. You, you do apologize. If you do someone an injury, you say you're sorry. You apologize. But as soon as she said that, you know, forgive me, sir. She said, I did not mean to step on your toe. She was ridiculed, and then she was immediately murdered, and then she was ridiculed again. And this is what has been the character of the French Revolution and all the revolutions which followed in its model. Ridicule every foundation of civility and morality and the rule of law. Now, British statesman Edmund Burke was watching the revolution from across the, across the channel. And he, he documented this French horror in his remarkable book about the revolution. It's called Reflections on the Revolution. You can look at that on a, on a browser also. Um, here, is, um, here are some quotes from his book. He said, humanity and compassion are ridiculed as the fruits of Christian superstition and Christian ignorance. So you take these virtues that we've worked for centuries to try to build into our culture, just so we can get along with each other and not be tearing us each other apart with cruelty and fierceness and viciousness, which, you know, that's our nature, isn't it? But if we can come to discipline ourselves, to have some self-control, govern ourselves, 
have some virtue in our lives. Um, they don't want that as part of their new world order. And so these are big differences between, you know, modern Americans must understand as criminal mobs are beginning to operate without being shut down and in some places, places are being lionized as being heroic. But all this is about to change as average citizens begin to realize what the mobs really want. Edmund Burke summarized the goals of the mob in France by saying, all the decent drapery of life is to be rudely torn off. So he said, that's, what, that's really what they're after. All the decent drapery of life is to be rudely torn off, not just torn off, but rudely torn off. And as one mob leader in America said just last week, if this country doesn't give us what we want, then we will burn down this system and replace it. Okay? So, where are we getting this culture that's exploding in our streets in the United States? Tomorrow, let's explore what the revolutionary mobs really want. To connect with us directly, please visit jeffreybotkin.com and send any questions or thoughts that you might have to questions at jeffreybotkin.com.